at the Resilience Journal, we are focused on on a on a longer timeline of resilience than what most you know people, cities, even climate studies look at. You know, um, yeah. uh, we uh, we see studies uh, that point to a bunch of feedback loops that are not included in most other studies, the most mainstream studies, and those feedback feedback loops. Uh, point to significant catastrophic consequences as early as mid-century. So instead of having this clock set in our minds and in our institutions and in our governments and companies to the end of the century and beyond, um, you know, we're, we're looking at this and we're saying, we need to reset this clock. We need to rethink and reimagine, right? Uh, what we need to do today to be ready, not in a hundred years, but in, 30 or 40 years, or maybe sooner than that. And because that's what the latest studies are telling us. That's what feedback loops tell us. And so, uh, but it's a pretty massive endeavor, you know, to kind of like reset an internal institutional corporate government clock. It takes yeah. what you're working on, a combination of transition communities and imagination. So if we can start with the imagination part, uh, and kind of walk us through what you're thinking is uh, lately on this challenge. Uh, you have been at your imagination project for a year now, uh, from what I saw on your web on your website. Uh, probably longer than that, but in terms of what you know, more of the formal process. Uh, I, I believe I read that you wanted it pretty much done by about this time this year. So. <laughs> Uh, so just bring us up to date on the imagination project and then tie it into this pretty massive and, and urgent resilience challenge that we're facing yeah. in the world today. Okay, so uh, yeah, I've been working on this, like you say, for, about, uh, for a bit longer than I thought I would be. But it's been really, really fascinating. And it was prompted by two things. So it was first prompted by a guy called David Fleming, who was a, a friend and mentor of mine who wrote a book called Lean Logic, uh, who used to say, if we are to create a sequel to the market economy, it will above all be a work of the imagination. Indeed. And, then, and then I read some research by uh, uh, a researcher in the US called Kyung Hee Kim that was published in 2010 was called the creativity crisis and what she did was she she brought together this massive data set of people who did what's called the torrance test for creative thinking it's the kind of gold standard creativity test in america that that measures like divergent thinking that ability to go you know if i said right uh, here's a here's a, a glass you've got a minute to think of as many different uses for this glass as possible go and you go oh you could make it into a hat or a uh, sort of very fragile shoulder pads or whatever you know that that's sort of divergent thinking that assembling of different things in different ways so her conclusion was looking at all of this data uh, was that imagination and iq rose together until 1990 and then in 1990 iq kept rising and imagination started to decline and it's been in what she called a steady and persistent decline ever since and when she published this research it was on the front page of front cover of newsweek magazine it was a big story, the creativity crisis, and all of the, and the, it was like there was a lot of soul searching in the U.S. about what does this mean, but it was all about what does this mean for economic growth, what does this mean for Hollywood and for Pixar. Uh, nobody, I never read anyone in the climate change, resilience, social justice movement say what does this mean for us, because actually, if if what we're trying to, if what we're seeing is a is a decline of the collective imaginative uh, skills, I suppose, or p potential, that's really important because what we're trying to do in transition is basically to say, it doesn't have to be like that. It could be like that. And actually that could be fantastic and it could be wonderful and the food will be better and the parties will be better. The conversation will be better. You'll feel more connected. You won't feel so lonely anymore. Will there'll be markets. There'll be da, 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 da rather than just keeping going in that direction. But I never heard anyone who, who talked about it. So the, that was the starting point in the book was, do we have an imagination crisis? And if we do, why? And what might we do about it? 
and you know there's there's other bits of surveys and research that kind of back that up and you know when you look around at, at the time now if there was ever a time in history when we needed our imaginations to be razor sharp and and completely uh, focused on what do we do now then because as Naomi Klein put it so beautifully in um, This Changes Everything, she said, you know, there are no non-radical solutions left. That the very nature of the climate crisis is there are no non-radical solutions left. So, uh, so that process then is, is really fundamentally one of the imagination. And when I look at what we've created in transition over the last uh, 12 years, one of the things I think is that we've created, uh, we've given people the the resources and the narrative to be able to create what I call what if spaces where you invite people together and you go, okay, so what if we did this in a different way? What, what if the future was something we were really looking forward to and the future was going to be something we were really excited about? What would we start doing now? And uh, you don't really get that in schools anymore because schools are all dominated by testing universities. There's less and less of that. Most people's work life, there's no space for that. And when we purge the present of those spaces where we can come together and imagine a future, then we're really in trouble. You know, business does it. They do like design charrettes and they do all of this sort of at the community scale in our civil, in our civilian lives. It really doesn't happen so much. So, so in the book, I look around and say, where are the good what if spaces? What are some really good stories of communities asking what if questions? And what would this stuff look like if we really revalued the imagination and i've done now over 40 different interviews with very very eclectic different people as part of the research which and you can find all of those on robhopkins.net as i go along i post all those blogs and one of the questions i ask everybody is if you had been elected as the prime minister or the president of your country so if you had been elected as the president of the us and you would run on a platform of make america imaginative again and you had decided that what was needed most of all right now was in, ed in education, in the workplace, in civil, civilian life, politics, was a real uh, reprioritizing of the imagination and creating the best circumstances in which the imagination could flourish. What would you do in your first hundred days in office? And what's nice is everybody asked that question start out by going, what a great question. <laughs> <laughs> it opens up so much, sort of, well, wow, gosh, yes. And actually that is the opposite of what is happening at the moment where so many people feel there's no possibility there's no future the future there's like a universal agreement the future is going to be awful you know and i i still think there is that window of possibility where we could create a future that's fantastic but it requires a profound rethinking of so many things and that's only going to happen if it's done in the context of uh, of the imagination absolutely so when is the book coming out what's the status <laughs> the status is uh, ask me in a, ask me in a couple of months. <laughs> it's going, I've, I've done most. I've done most. I've, my, most of the research is done. I'm just at the stage of uh, of nailing down who the publisher is going to be, and then and then uh, and then the writing will happen. So I'm probably it's early next year. Okay. Well, it'll be uh, it'll be none too soon. That's for sure. Uh, given the urgency yeah. of. Uh, of how much we need uh, imagination above all. So uh, 40 interviews plus your own thinking plus the work of, of the existing uh, transition communities and uh, uh, what would you say is uh, the result or let's say some nuggets of, of, um, of imagination thinking that can shed some light on this resilience challenge uh, Again, you know, given the urgency, given the fact that we may only have 20 to 30 years between now and mid-century to really get our act together and, and become resilient between now and then. So uh, going back to Naomi Klein, one of the, I mean, you know, we all love Naomi Klein and her thinking and everything she said in that book and, and since. And in fact, she's actually been to Puerto Rico and she's writing something on Puerto Rico as well. So, uh, but, you know, the main, uh, I guess, if, if any criticism can be leveled at that work is the fact that she calls, uh, she and, and really the, the broader climate movement, uh, uh, it's pretty much focused on the solutions that will work if we had a lot more time than we actually do. Uh, and so they're all amazing solutions, but guess what? We just don't have the time for those solutions to be bought into by 
a massive number of countries and societies and actually executed and implemented in, um, uh, on time. So, uh, so it's a timing issue. Uh, and so that's really what kind of comes back to, okay, so what is it that we can do uh, from an imaginative perspective that can be thought of and then executed on time? Uh, any, any light, any, any ideas that you have uh, heard or, or thought about? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I mean, one of the, one of the things that, um, that st struck me about Naomi Klein's book, I wrote a review of it, uh, and uh, was it actually it took till page something like 384 before she said, but maybe we could do something. Maybe actually as citizens and communities, there's something we could do. After 384 pages of basically oil companies are shits, aren't they? Like, yeah, well, I, I think if I pick if I pick this book off the bookshelf, you don't need to spend 380 pages convincing me that oil companies are are, are horrendous. You know. Yeah, she spent quite a bit of time like X-raying and diagnosing the problem before she actually came around. Yeah. But still, it's it's worth it's worth the effort. Which, which has its place. But I think one of the things that that actually has come out for me that most fascinated me about the research for the book so far is uh, is about cortisol, actually. So, uh, so deep in the brain, sort of from like from there down and from there in, in the middle of the brain, there's a thing called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is the part of the brain, which is most associated with memory, uh, and with imagination. And although in neuroscience now, the thinking isn't that, you know, each function is performed by a single place in the brain. You, know, you have these networks that fire in the brain and there are different networks that fire in the brain associated with imagination, whether it's the default mode network or these different networks that fire. The hippocampus is at the heart of all of those networks. And when the hippocampus is damaged, we lose that ability to think about the future and we also lose our memory of, of, of the past. And we know that when people uh, have post-traumatic stress disorder, when children have grown up in tra traumatic settings, uh, that the hippocampus shrinks. And when we are in states of uh, anxiety, and particularly when there's a lot of cortisol, which arises from stress and trauma and, and fear in our lives, that the, the hippocampus of all the parts in the brain is particularly uh, susceptible to cortisol. And it visibly shrinks when there's a lot of cortisol in the system. And I mention that because uh, some of the neuroscientists that I've talked to talk about this idea that um, uh, you know that the, 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 that that's how you squash the imagination. And one of the reasons we're seeing the, our collective imagination uh, contracting is because uh, we are more and more awash with cortisol. Whether it's from the fact that you know, 20 years ago, the only people who sat in front of a screen all day long expected to respond to its messages were air traffic controllers and they worked three hour shifts. You know, and now we're all in this kind of living, constantly trying to keep up with the present. Uh, we have the media constantly bombarding us with this sort of terrifying, awful, bad news. We have government imposed austerity. We have people who are really, really struggling just to get by every day. And as the cortisol rises, the, the imagination shrinks. And, and I, I start wondering about whether, also from a, from a study I read recently that was talking about how as there's more and more CO2 in the air, agricultural crops just pack on loads of carbohydrates and lose the ability to take up particularly iron and zinc, which are the minerals that are vital uh, for brain development, particularly for the hippocampus. So I start to worry whether the further we get into climate change, we become actually less able to imagine the way out of it. So our brains are, are become less, uh, less able to sort of function in that really kind of imaginative way, which again, I think comes back to that possibility that now is the window where we have to really fire the imagination up because actually as we go on and, and, and our attention spans become shattered by, uh, by social media and smartphones, which are uh, the most extraordinary potent things we carry around in our pocket wreaking havoc to our imaginations. I spoke to one guy, Dr. Larry Rosen, uh, who's a neuroscientist, who said, I would say that our imaginations are declining in exact correlation to the amount of time that we spend on our smartphones. So, <laughs> so it brings to me that idea of also, how do you really involve and campaign around climate change at a time when people can't even focus on, you know, 40 second clips of Love Island without getting bored, you know? 
Uh, and so, so for me, there is something about that we really need to recognise that, and and that when we always frame what we need to do in the context of particularly collapse, actually, you know, when, when we always we have to do this because everything is going to collapse and we're all going to be eating out of dustbins and we're going to have the sea coming up to our ears and it's going to be awful. That feels to me like a, a less galvanizing way of getting people on board than if we uh, than if we can tell a really delicious narrative about the kind of future that we could still create and so a lot of what we do in transition have done for the last 10 or 12 years is to really try to paint that picture of if you woke up in puerto rico in 20 years time and there had been the most phenomenal transition had taken place over that time in terms of food and energy and democracy and involvement and economics what would it look like what would it taste like what would you have for breakfast what would you see as you as you walk down the road to work what would your kids be learning in school you know and there's something about that thing of creating a vision of the future that is like kind of throwing the whirlpool uh, in front of us that starts to draw us towards it and i guess you know your your question was you know, what have we learned about transition about how to do this stuff faster? And I think that, that we need to take this stuff as much as we can out of the hands of expecting the people who are, who in theory should be doing this stuff. You know, we need to recognize that they're not going to do it. And so we need to do it. And that when you, when you start working at a community scale, you can move so much faster than you can when you're waiting for somebody else, when you're waiting for the cavalry to come riding to the rescue. And I went to, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a place in Belgium called Liège, which is a former industrial city, about half a million people, not a particularly remarkable place. And uh, they, uh, they started doing transition there about six years ago. They had a transition group, it started doing different projects, had different groups. The two groups that were the strongest one were a food group and an economics group. And they came together and uh, and looking back on it, I think what they did was they really invited the imagination by asking a really good what if question. And the what if question was, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? And they invited into that conversation academics, chefs, people who ran food shops, food writers in the newspaper, anybody who had anything to do with food to a series of big discussions about how that might work. I went there for one of the first events and I thought, this is really interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. <clears throat> I, w I came home. I didn't hear anything. I went back uh, after four years. And in that time, they've started 14 new cooperatives, a farm, two vineyards, a brewery, two shops, a pedal powered delivery business around the city, a mushroom growing business. In order to do that, they've raised 5 million euros from local people investing in those cooperatives and owning those cooperatives. And uh, I met that was the mayor. Four, four years. In, that was in four years it took them to Four start. years. And I met the mayor of the city who said, uh, seven years ago we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. And the, and the municipality owns a lot of land uh, around the city that they just, they just let for different things. And they're making all that land available for young people who want to grow food and start enterprises that are part of this whole kind of a process. You know, there was, and when I asked the guy who, who was coordinating it, how, you do, how do you do this? He said, we created a really strong narrative. You know, it came back to that story that people could communicate it really easily. They could meet someone in the pub. Oh, do you know what we're doing? We're going to be, you know, within generations time, the majority of food. And that within that what if question, it then opens up a whole load of other ones. That's what's, you know, for me, when I look at the, the last 50 years and that move in one direction, towards monoculture, the dismantling of resilience, the rise of Amazon and Walmart and all of these awful, awful uh, organized, these psychopathic organizations. As you move in that direction, you see a shutting down of diversity, a shutting down of possibility, the rise of that Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative kind of a narrative. What you see in somewhere like Liège, when you start to go the other direction, you're moving back towards the local, you're moving back towards uh, diversity you're opening up the possibilities is that at every step you create the opportunity for you know the opportunities for people to say oh 
yeah, well, what if I did this? Actually, I could bring that into it. I see it in my town where some people started a new mill. We now have the first mill for 100 years in, in, in the town, milling locally grown wheat and stuff. So they're getting farmers, again, growing stuff for the local market. They're making wheat and oats and stuff that are then being sold locally. You know, I, I'm a director of a craft brewery here that we started. And, uh, and so we start thinking, oh, what beers could we make with spelt? What beers could we make with, uh, with pea flour? Can you make beer out of pea flour? You can, and it's really, really nice. And then, and then, and then you see the, the local bakers thinking, oh, well, what could we do with that? So as you move in that direction, the imagination, the possibilities all start to open up and expand. So for me, the key way that we do this stuff faster and at scale is not by imagining there's a silver bullet, but by imagining it's more like a sort of silver buckshot, you know, that you can have these ideas uh, uh, that, that, that people start at their community scale, they can move faster, they don't need so much permission, they can get stuff done. But the most vital bit of how that works is that they share those stories. And actually, I've come to see more than anything the transition movement as being uh, a network of storytelling. Yeah. People saying what works, what doesn't work uh, in the place where they live. So it, 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 it sounds uh, fascinating, and, and thank you for, uh, for sharing that, uh, that really important insight. Uh, uh, so it sounds like, you know, when, when, you, when you describe the, uh, you know, the, the cross current, right, I mean, from, from the, uh, the monolithic kind of like large enterprise and, and industrial model to this decentralized community-based, local-based uh, 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 approach, it's almost like a decentralization of thinking, a decentralization of, of idea generation, so that instead of us relying on, on Apple to kind of solve technology, uh, we, can, uh, we can rely on, on us, on our local thinkers in our local communities to come up with these ideas. Um, uh, and, and, and from your results, it turns out to be a pretty fast model. So it can really sprout and lead to significant uh, innovations uh, very quickly and, and very actionable. So people can actually put them into practice within a very short time in, in many places uh, at once. Now, um, there, is, there is a particular challenge to that, though, it seems uh, to me, and it's kind of like location-based. So in some places around the world, like here in Puerto Rico, for example, and, and, and most of these coastal areas that are vulnerable to uh, to particular climate impacts like sea level rise, like you know monster storms and so forth, and uh, or other locations that are a lot more vulnerable to droughts, perhaps or heat waves or forest fires, and uh, that you know to place a transition community in one of those locations and have them do their work uh, without having somebody uh, at least you know attend to infrastructure and you know coastal adaptation or relocation of, of vulnerable communities and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's almost like two agendas. You have the transition agenda you're describing that can happen anywhere spontaneously and driven by that vision uh, and that it can be done. Um, but then if, it, if that community happens to be along a coast vulnerable where in 20 years it'll be flooded, uh, then, you know, then it really raises the question of whether the transition model or any, any model really that is functional in this scenario uh, would have to be, you know, it's kind of like, you know, geography dependent, right? Yeah. In other words, where is that community it has a lot to do with its long-term success in the face of these climate uh, risks. Um, so then it can actually do its work and work its magic, you know, for a longer period of time and not be interrupted by some massive relocation project that we need the world mm. to do. So has that been kind of like thought through or is that something that uh, when you hear it kind of like triggers some other thought maybe, you yeah. know, of a kind of like geography based or location based away from certain climate risks so that if you happen to be a person in a vulnerable coast or in a vulnerable drought area uh, or whatever, you, you know, maybe that, that community may want to, uh, Thing about relocating and setting up this transition project in a safer harbor, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that I would say is, you know, when we when we initially conceived of transition, the idea was inspired by the contraction and convergence uh, model. You know, that idea that the global north is up here, 
it needs to get to here. The, the global south are here, they need to get to here. There is a, there is a place at which we can meet where, 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 the, where it works, you know. And so we really designed transition as this bit, as the kind of the detox for the global north, that idea of how do we get from here to here? Well, that's only going to happen, you know, if you're Donald Trump, your whole approach is fossil fuels are completely irreplaceable. The current way of doing things is completely non-negotiable. But actually, the only way we're going to get from here to here is if we can say, yeah, but actually, that's going to be brilliant. That's going to be so great. When we get there, you have no idea how absolutely awesome and fantastic it's going to be. And the best food and the best beer and everything is going to be down there. And let's, let's go there. So that, that was really our initial starting question was how do we become the storytellers that means we can move from here down to here? Um, and, and at the same time, in answer to your question, there are some places where people just, we're not going to be able to, people aren't going to be able to stay there. There are places that are becoming uninhabitable. Are there still going to be people living in Las Vegas in 50 years time? Uh, you know, and, and in some of the very low lying islands, it's, it's really tricky. And, you know, so in, in, you know, I, one of the people I interviewed for the book recently was a guy called Robert McFarlane, who is the most brilliant writer about nature and things. And we were talking about imagination. He said, he said, you know, we have to recognize you know, that to degree imagination is a is a function of privilege in terms of in terms of the maslow's hierarchy of needs if your if your most immediate needs aren't being met if you don't have shelter you don't have food uh you don't have any social uh, support structures in place it's very hard to be thinking constructively and creatively and imaginatively about the future when you don't know where your next meal's coming from uh, or you're being bombed or uh, you've got no electricity or whatever you know so, so I would, uh, I would make that point you know, that the transition model, as such, probably isn't that appropriate at a time of, of at a time of major collapse and crisis in that moment. Right. But actually, what's really interesting is is seeing in places like like in Christchurch in New Zealand, where they had a massive earth that massive earthquake six or seven years ago, where there had been very active transition groups and groups like transition who in the years before had been uh, building networks and connections so that actually then when the, the earthquake happened, they were able to use those networks. So the emergency services uh, all went to the big cities and kind of bypassed this particular place. Uh, and when they did come, they needed networks of how they could contact and involve everybody. And the time bank that had been set up by the transition group proved to be the kind of structure that they could use you know so the, the, those kind of that groundwork that had been laid was really important i did also want to want to ask about the concept of of and you kind of alluded to it earlier the i mean in your website you call it the economy our uppercase re and then economy like re economy right and so um I and mean, you explained very nicely uh on the website and, and in various uh writings you know what that means in terms of reimagining or rethinking the economy and, and creating a different model altogether that, as you're saying right now, can actually happen fairly quickly uh, when people are inspired uh, by the right imagination and, and kind of like the right politics, right? The right engagement and the right mm -hmm. unity uh, behind it. And so, uh, but the, the, it's almost also, I mean, when, when, when I was reading about it and, and kind of following your work over the years, uh, you know, it's, it's, it really presents a different paradigm of thinking about what an economy is all about, right? So again, you have all these conflicted models and, and you have a dominant model that, is, that has been uh, uh, driving our lives for the last 200 years. And, um, and then this more decentralized kind of human scale model that, uh, that you folks are uh, driving and behind. And uh, now the question though is, uh, you know, in the context of this climate urgency, right, uh, it's really a challenge of scale. How do we take this re-economy movement or this transition model, you know, um, uh, more broadly, um, and really see to it that it scales, that it reaches more places, more people, that it kind of uh, triggers that inspiration, that imagination spontaneously in more of these uh, places around the world, uh, than we have seen to date. Uh, how many transition communities do you have right now? Um, well, there's 50 countries 
And the ones that we know about, I think it's about 2,000, but there are lots as well that we don't know about because they don't always tell us what they're doing. All right, so what's a good estimate? 2,500, perhaps? 2,500? Let's just say 500 that you don't know about. <laughs> so, okay, so, so we're going from 2,500 transition communities that impact a certain population. Um, so if we're looking at transition and really the imagination and the inspiration and the fast action uh, that you're describing that happens uh, in these communities, I mean, man, I mean, uh, if we can just spread that around. So how do we, how do we get this story to just, Massify, just really scale and inspire a lot more people in a lot more places. Well, like William Gibson, the science fiction writer, used to say, you know, we um, the, the future is already here. It's just, it's just not evenly distributed. You know, so so there are stories of of, of everything that we need. Um, so just, I suppose, just for the for the listeners, it might be useful just to say a little bit about what we mean by reconomy. You know, what we started seeing in transition after. Uh, three or four years was people at the community scale starting their own enterprises cooperatives often but not always uh, saying if we if this place needs a new economy we need to be the ones who are going to start it so let's start our own energy company let's start our own housing company let's start our own food businesses and um, we started to look and look at these and see there was there were things in common with them they were they were businesses that were low carbon in terms of how they operated they were trying to bring about an appropriate degree of localization. They were about building resilience into the local economy. They had a degree of saying, how as a community do we own assets, uh, land, buildings, businesses? Uh, they kind of put care at the center of what they did. They weren't just driven by a, a money-making ethic. They wanted to uh, make the place they lived a more caring place. And they wanted to create opportunities for people to rather than put their money in the bank, who then take the money off away and usually use it to fund the worst things that you then watch on news that evening on the television, you could actually find ways that you could invest into the place where you live and see that sort of change happening. So the Reconomy project we started in Transition Network was designed to try and support that and to create a network of those different organizations to gather some of their stories together uh, and to promote what they were doing. So, uh, so there are lots of there's transition, there's re economy projects happening across Europe and in different places. Um, in my town here in Totnes, which is the sort of the first transition initiative, I guess, you know, uh, there we now have two projects where the community is becoming its own housing developer. Will be over a hundred homes that are in genuinely in community, where the whole development is in community ownership, hotel, workshop spaces, hundred percent renewable energy. Uh, powering what's happening. Uh, we have an event every year called the Local Entrepreneur Forum, where four or five local businesses come along and pitch and say, my name is so-and-so, I've started a business doing such and such, what I need is this, this and this, can anybody help? And people offer them money and resources and buildings or whatever. There's now 30 businesses gone through that. And on average, uh, I think it's raised something like 90,000 pounds to get those businesses started and created a real network I've started a brewery here, a craft brewery, a sort of social enterprise brewery, and we're about to sell the whole business into community ownership. So it kind of looks like, that's kind of what it looks like, you know, that idea that we can uh, move our support from the massive ghost town, everywhere looking the same monocultural economy, to one where we're seeding all sorts of things at the local scale. And in some places, like I mentioned the story of Liège, you really get a taste of, wow, one of the things that really struck me in Liège was speaking to the guy who was a manager of the shop. They opened the shop, just a big unit, painted it white, put the food out in boxes, tell the story of the farmer where the food comes from. And they did a worst case, medium case, best case business plan to start this shop. Within three months, they were way ahead of their best case scenario. They've already opened a second shop. They're cheaper than the supermarket uh, and they're doing really, really well. And when I spoke to him, the manager, he said, uh, well, I think... You know, very soon we'll be able to open 10 shops. And then by the time we've got 15, the supermarkets will start to fragilize, which is a direct translation from a French word. It doesn't quite work in English, but it kind of does beautifully as well. You know, that the old economy will start to fragilize as you, as you start to build that infrastructure. What does so the you, word mean? Sorry? What does it mean, fragilize? It mean? I think it means that, you know, they, that, that, they, 
the, the support for them starts to kind of dwindle away and those business models are run on just in time sort of uh, 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 driven by shareholders. You know, actually, if you have another model rising up alongside it, which meets people's needs better and tells a stronger story and people are able, or people are more drawn to that, you know, then, then that you, you start to create an alternative that people can actually move to and the supermarkets start to kind of fade away is, the, is, is, is their thinking. You know, the question that you asked was, you know, how do we accelerate that up? What, what does it need? What kind of support does it need? And clearly at the moment, the global economy uh, is kind of moving in the opposite direction. I think we need, uh, you know, what you see in Liège is, is, is an enlightened uh, local government. And it's one of the bits that is now one of the key areas of exploration in transition. You know, we've shown here's a model in a lot of places you can take this and you inoculate the local culture with it like a mycorrhizal fungus and it will run and it will fruit in some places you expect and some places you don't expect but it works you know this is something that that, that actually uh, can be a real vibrant catalyst for bringing people together to think about and then build a new economy the really interesting bit then is what does it look like then when the municipality the local government comes to meet that the other way because we even we would never say and have never said that all we need is transition that would be ridiculous you know you need local business you, you, you need you need government you need local government you need all these things coming together but you can start at a local scale in such a way that you can start to change that story really really quickly you know in just in terms of practical things you know what I, like i mentioned before i'm involved in this brewery i i think the craft beer movement is a really interesting example in something that has grown very very quickly that really puts imagination at the center the more imaginative your brewery is the better it's going to succeed if you're ab InBev, you can't copy that stuff because nobody believes you. You have absolutely no integrity to pretend to be a craft brewery because people will sniff you out a mile off and they'll all go off somewhere else. And that happened with a simple tax break that viewed small tax brewery, that viewed small breweries different from the big breweries. And provided you stayed below a certain amount of output, you paid a lot less tax. As a result of which, there's now this massive flourishing all across the world of, of breweries and amazing flavors and tastes. You know, so you can imagine something similar around around local food. You can imagine something around energy. You know, we here in the UK we came very close. The government created a community energy strategy, which was a policy platform for enabling community energy companies all across the country and a decentralisation of energy. And then there was an election, and the next lot came in, funded by all companies, and all went out the window. You know, but those templates are there for actually how we could. Uh, how we could support that. Um, yeah, and I think a part of what we need to do is to be telling the stories about the places where this works. You know, because like you said, it, it's yeah. happening in places. And there was an amazing film that was made in France a couple of years ago called Tomorrow, or Demain, which told a lot of those stories and wasn't the usual kind of eco film where 98% of it is gloom and doom and how screwed we all are with a little 2% happy chapter on the end by which stage you don't believe a word they say. They did it the other way around. So they got all the problem out of the way in the first two minutes. And then the film is then an exploration of solutions and stories from all over the world. You know, I think if, if, we, had, if we had a media that told those stories, things would also move a hell of a lot faster. That would definitely, uh, definitely help. Of course, uh, you know, I'm in the media, so it, that's, that's music to my ears, that's for sure. Even though uh, our, our, uh, our publication just started a couple of months ago, but uh, but that's the space. That's definitely the space that uh, that we're in, that we want to be in uh, moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, uh, so it's fascinating, I and mean, what you're describing is is gets to a I hate to call it formula because you know formulas tend to be kind of like you know rigid and and applicable only under certain conditions and whatnot. But it is a certain path, let's say, a certain path forward to combine the energy and the imagination and the intuition uh, of, of, of that local community that gets together and says we can do things differently and kind of like bucks the system and, and kind of like, you know, goes its own way uh, in the transition model. Uh, but also to the extent that governments and more, more established institutional order uh, comes in and, and, and becomes part of that process, then really triggers a, a faster acceleration or a scaling that is needed in more places. So it kind of uh, throws me back. I used to be a, uh, uh, the bulk of my career was in business journalism. And, and you know, uh, so we used to write a lot about 
you know, economic development, industrial policy, and what governments can do to attract companies and to set up, in, you know, incentive structures and tax breaks and, 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 and human capital and infrastructure and all that. So they become the new big hub, right? And so, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, we may be able to like, uh, you know, rip a page off of that book and apply it here and say in a different scale on a different kind of like, you know, dimension, um, if you do have a very visionary mayor and city council uh, or state legislature or, or national, you know, government in some really unique country, uh, they can they can combine. They can they can provide a certain, you know, um, uh, condition for these transition communities to flower even faster and mm. you know bigger and better. And uh, uh, that, along with, you know, uh, getting the word out, whether it's media or movies or art and culture, uh, uh, would just um, you know help us scale this. Uh, mm. really needed. I mean, it, it seems yeah, like. It seems like you know clearly the work you have put in these 10, 12 years of of trial and error of really proving the model and, and creating these stories and these case studies um, are voluminous right now and they're they're sufficient mm -hmm. it seems uh, plus the your new book coming out uh, uh, of course as well uh, to really give us the information that we need uh, to then you know uh, have folks around the world. Uh, put into practice yeah i was i was thinking as you were speaking about about two places and uh there's a there's a place in um in the north of england called preston which is a fairly sort of unremarkable quite depressed former uh, mill town uh has lost a lot of its employment um, and was very economically depressed and they had a, a local government who who were planning to just go the very conventional route. They wanted to open a big shopping mall, bring in a big, bring in the big companies who were the, in all the shopping malls. Uh, and then the big company pulled and said they weren't going to come and the whole scheme collapsed. And they were rather left scratching their heads. And then they decided, and I don't know quite where the inspiration came from, but they decided to take a completely different approach. And where that approach started with was with bringing together the seven biggest organizations in the city who spend public money so the hospitals the university uh the fire brigade these the police whatever the universe the, and, and the municipality themselves the city council and they mapped where does where does the money go we spend 750 million pounds a year all of us together of public money on goods and services and stuff where does it go and nobody knew nobody had a clue how much of the money that we spend stays in Preston, stays in this city. Nobody had the foggiest idea. So they commissioned these people who did this big study, where does all the money go? They found that only 4% of what they spent was spent into the economy of Preston. The rest of it just poured out. You know, that using that analogy of the leaky bucket economy, you know, that money comes in and then it all just pours away. And that was the catalyst for them. They were so horrified by this you know, they are there to serve the people of Preston. They are supposed to be working in the best interests of the people of Preston to make it the best place it could possibly be. And actually, they're just chucking all the money out the window, you know, and, uh, and, and its potential to make stuff happen and to transform that city is just being, is being lost, you know. So uh, actually, that process then has then taken them into a whole rethinking of, of, of what they do and how they do it. So they're bringing their pension fund back to the city in order to build affordable housing, they are looking at how, when they want to spend their money on a big project, like building a hospital or something, rather than just saying there will be one tender for this construction project where only massive national construction companies can apply, they break their tender down into different bits so that smaller local companies uh, can apply for that. They're looking at the, the, the food in the hospital. They're creating a cooperative inspired by the Evergreen Co-ops in Cleveland. They're setting up a cooperative to do the laundry, to do the energy, setting up an energy company for the city, trying to set up a new bank for the city. You know, just by asking that first question, where does all our money go? You know, that's something that could happen anywhere, even in a country, you know, like in, in Puerto Rico, there's still money that's going around and going somewhere. 
you know, how, where are the leaks in that bucket that could be plugged? Because every hole in that bucket is a potential livelihood, potential business, potential uh, cooperative that could actually reimagine uh, the economic story of that place. And the other thing that came to mind is there's a place in France called Ungersheim, which we always said from the beginning, transition is something that communities do. So you, if you're a local government, your role is not to initiate transition because transition is something that the citizens own. They start, they drive. You'll have a role later, which is to come in and support the things that they're doing and invest in what they're doing and help them. But if you come in and run it, then it's not going to work. <coughs> but in Ungersheim, they had this incredibly visionary mayor, this guy called Jean-Claude Mensch, who is a former mining town. The mines all closed. And he was a former miner. His father was a miner. He worked as a union rep organizer. And when the mines collapsed, things were really, really difficult. He saw a film about transition in 2011 and said, let's do that, all of that. And Ungersheim is this incredible now case study of what transition looks like in terms of food. All the food in the public buildings and the, and the schools are organic. They created an eight hectare market garden to produce it, to train young people. They've built co-housing. They've built a, a place where they extend the season and create more jobs by turning surplus food into passata and chutneys and this kind of thing. Uh, they've made the biggest solar farm in the region. They have a local currency. Da, 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 da. It's an amazing story. You'll find it on the Transition Network website. But is, um, he, is, he, is he a public figure? Is he a government figure? Or is he the mayor, but the way he does it is beautifully hands off. He kind of catalyzed it, put that idea out there. And then actually each of the projects is more sort of, there's a film they made about it called What Are We Waiting For? And what you see in the film is he, he's just very much in the background. He goes along, he puts the chairs out for the meetings, he's washing up the cups, he's helping with the harvest, he's putting the lids on the jars of jam. You know, it's a really, it's an amazing example of actually what, what, what you could do. And again, what it looks like when those two things uh, meet in the middle and come together. Yeah, it does take a, a, a special... Uh, relationship there between a visionary government leader like that uh, and then a community a willing community that uh, that has you know its own leaders and its own um, you know uh, uh, movers uh, to get it done uh, so well, we forget sometimes uh, I think, actually you know we, we forget sometimes that, that that we do have the power to elect those people if we choose to you know, there, there are places where people you had a transition group and then someone in that transition group said, right, I'm going to run for the local government or a whole group of people run and become the local government and then use that as the opportunity to do. There's a town in England called Froome where a whole load of independent people agreed a platform first. They were across the political spectrum. They ran in the election. They took over the council. They're now using that council to, uh, to buy buildings into public ownership to create renewable energy companies. You know, actually, if we can... If we find the right people who can step up to that and we can generate that support around those ideas, you know, there's a huge amount that can be done then as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like a layered scenario where you have first the community that can do it on its own uh, yeah. without government involvement, without, you know, and they, they can actually get it done and that's happening. And then you have the, 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 uh, the scenarios where you have a willing government that gets it uh, and collaborates. Uh, and then you have that, that model you just mentioned where the transition leaders then become the government uh, and get it done. And so, um, yeah, so it depends on the place. It depends on the people and the culture and what they want to do and what they're able to do. And, and if they run too, you know, too hard into a, a, a partisan wall of folks that don't want to anything to do with transition, then they can just do it on their own. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so it really opens up, a, you know, quite a few possibilities there, uh, and it goes back to the uh, you know, origin of this conversation. It goes back to imagination and, and, and the positive story. And I think you called it it's somewhere on the website. I wrote down uh, the um, positive possibilities, you know, and, and uh, mm. that envisioning positive possibilities and bold new ways of living and working. And that's what uh, you've just described today. So fantastic yeah, and, and i think part of you know part of the answer to your question about how do we move this faster is is by recognizing that there's not one there's not one uh there's not just one way of doing it and actually yeah. the only way that we're going to figure out how to do it is if in some places it's driven by the community in other places the municipality is 
coming to meet them, you know, that actually it's an experiment. And we always say in transition, you know, if I try and do this on my own, uh, it'll be too little, it'll be too late. If we wait for the government, no, hang on, which way right? If I try and do it on my own, it'll be too little. If we wait for the government, it'll be too late. But if we get together with the people around us, it might just be enough and it might just be in time. And a key part of that is to say, you know, we don't know the answers, but we learn them by trying things and sharing and having this kind of network of stories, I suppose. Fantastic. So we can let that be the final word. And, and, uh, and thank you again thank for this you. conversation. Uh, it lived up to the, uh, to the expectation and surpassed it. So good luck with your book. Let us know uh, when, you're, when you're near the date so we can have another conversation like this and, uh, and write about that, yeah. that and, uh, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. And I, and I just want to say, you know, certainly on behalf of the, uh, you know, the, the transition movement in 50 countries, you know, the, there's many, many people who very much feel they're standing in solidarity with, with people in Puerto Rico and, and what you've all been through. And, uh, you know, we, there's lots of love and solidarity coming at you from, um, from the transition movement all over the place. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. That uh, really appreciate it. And I'll include that in the article so the message can be relayed uh, to everybody who reads it. So thank you for that. And and, um, and let's see if we can bring some of those transition communities here. That's for sure. And that's yeah, that's yeah. certainly a, uh, a project to work on. Great. Okay. Thank you for All your right. time. Take care. Bye-bye now.